Hi, and welcome to another episode of Hacker's Misadventures in Scale Modeling Feature Friday. Today, we're going to be looking at Japanese aircraft. Now, I got two short videos, one about nine minutes long, the other one's about seven minutes long. The first one gives an explanation of the, the jets that they did have. Now, <clears throat> It's done by a thing called War Thunder. Now he's using um, computer generated image aircraft based on flight simulators. So, and he gives a short history, but I'm going to run it. And if you disagree with it, that's fine. I, I'm not too sure about the one part part, but I'll tell you when I get to it. And the other one is the main focus subject that most people focus on, and that's the um, Japanese jet that did get built and flown. So let's go and uh, see what they have to say. Japanese jets of World War II? What do you mean? They didn't have any, did they? Actually, it's not as clear-cut as you might think. What do we even consider a proper jet aircraft? For instance, the revolutionary German ME-163 Comet was coffee. actually rocket-powered and not a jet, while the P-51 Mustang or the Soviet LAGG-3 actually had some features of a jet aircraft. Here's what we're talking about. Japanese engineers were as aware of the principles of jet propulsion as their colleagues overseas. For instance, when they acquired a Soviet LAGG-3 in 1939, they were completely unfazed by the design of the air intake based on the Yefremov turboreactor. Air flowing into the intake was compressed, then heated by a radiator, after which the hot, pressurized air exited through the exhaust, producing a bit of additional thrust. Likewise, Japanese engineers simply noted the existence of a similar system on the captured P-51C, which made use of the Meredith effect. In fact, Japanese design bureaus and aviation research centers were actively looking into the possibility of creating a jet aircraft since the second half of the 1930s. Big aircraft manufacturers made their forays into the field but were very mindful of the conservative stance of the military elite while small independent companies were much more open to all sorts of experimentation. For instance, we know about Katsuodori, a ramjet concept developed by Kayaba. The fighter shared quite a few similarities with the ME-163, but featured small vertical stabilizers on the tips of its main planes instead of a conventional stabilizer at the rear of the aircraft. Furthermore, while the Comet was rocket-powered, Japanese engineers planned to equip their design with an actual ramjet propulsion system. The plane would still use rocket pods for takeoff and initial acceleration, but then it was jet time. Design work on the Katsuodori progressed into 1944, but then it was abandoned in favor of the Ki-200, which was basically the Japanese Comet. How is it possible then that when it mattered the most, Japan was left without a single jet fighter, while their closest ally, Germany, was building hundreds of them? There are two main reasons for that, and the first one is a matter of perspective. Now, in the 21st century, the advantages of a jet engine over a propeller engine are rather obvious, but in the first half of the 1940s, the situation was rather different. The first turbines were pretty hard to manufacture, use, and maintain. By many metrics, they were simply worse than their predecessors. Not to mention that war is often a matter of numbers. Why would you invest in building a single unproven jet fighter when you could spend the same time and resources to build 10 piston-engined ones? If you look at it like that, the miracle of the early adoption of a new type of engine in Germany doesn't seem like a breakthrough or a miracle at all. It seems more like a reckless, last-ditch effort to do something about the overwhelming air supremacy of the Allies. Another thing about Japan at the time is that it had to deal with industrial backwardness in metallurgy, mechanical engineering, and radioelectronics. 
and that's without even mentioning the opposition by the staunch conservatives in the military. Eventually, even those conservatives agreed to accelerate efforts to produce a domestic jet fighter, but that happened only in 1943 when they started losing in the Pacific. At the same time, it took Japan a lot of effort to get the technical documentation for the ME-163 and its rocket engine, as well as the blueprints for the first German turbojets that they could use to make their own designs. It was very easy for the Japanese to reverse engineer the airframe of the Comet, but the rocket engine proved to be more of a challenge. The work on the Ki-200 interceptor was slow due to a whole range of insurmountable technical difficulties. The only time the prototype took to the skies right before the end of the war ended in tragedy. There was an engine malfunction at low altitude and the plane crashed, condemning the pilot to death. Engineers working on the Japanese turbojet weren't doing any better. After acquiring the blueprints for the Messerschmitt ME-262, experts at Nakajima decided to do it their way and try to solve problems of the aircraft instead of just blindly copying the original. They went with straight wings, ditching the slight sweep back of the ME-262, and replaced slotted flaps with more advanced split flaps. Furthermore, the airframe of the Japanese version was noticeably smaller. It could have become an excellent early jet, but by the time the engines were ready, the war was almost over. The Kika took to the air only in mid-1945 when it was simply too late. It couldn't change anything. During its second flight, aimed at testing rocket-assisted takeoff units, the aircraft crashed. And that was it for Japan's first jet now, aircraft. I'm not too sure if that actually happened, because there is an airframe that still Nevertheless, exists. while they were waiting for turbojets to arrive, Japanese engineers managed to create several brilliant planes. Take the J-7W Shinden, for example, with its amazing canard design. The plan was to outfit the first variants with radial engines in a pusher configuration and replace them with turbojets once they became available. Then there was the R-2Y Keun Kai. Its prototype was equipped with piston engines, but its production variant was also to receive turbojets. One last thing to mention is that after the war, American specialists discovered a very interesting high-speed, high-altitude interceptor prototype known as the Ki-83. The results of its flight testing were shocking, to say the least. When it came to its acceleration capabilities, max speed and level flight, and climb rate, the Japanese plane outperformed both the late Lightning and the brand-new Grumman F-7F. The reason for this surprising performance only became evident after careful examination. As it turned out, exhaust gases were led from the turbocharger turbine to the end of the engine nacelle and exited through wastegates positioned at the end of the nacelle, providing something akin to jet thrust. And so much thrust, in fact, that in some modes it contributed up to an additional 50 kilometers an hour. In other words, when it came to building jets, Japanese engineers didn't lack skills or expertise. What they didn't have was enough time to turn their vision into a reality. Now we look at the main uh, focus of, of this video. Now this is an aircraft I want to build. And there it's the only example of the Japanese jet technology that actually flew. So let's watch and see what they have to say. The mighty German ME-262 fighter jet is one of the most well-known and recognizable vehicles developed in World War II. It being a revolutionary idea and if not for Germany being beyond saving at the time of its introduction, the jet may have posed a serious threat to the Allied forces who would have needed to engage this borderline futuristic fighter in the skies. Knowing of this craft, Japanese engineers wanted a piece for themselves. Japan's interest in jet aircraft increased in September 1944, when the Japanese air attaché in Berlin sent a large number of detailed reports on the German Messerschmitt ME-262 fighter program. The Nakajima Kitsuka, or Kika, in English, Orange Blossom, was Japan's first jet aircraft. The Kika had a wingspan of 10 meters, a length of 8.125 meters, and a height of 2.95 meters. 
it being essentially a smaller scaled down version of the ME262, you would maybe expect it to perform nearly the same as its German counterpart. But, in reality, it had a few issues, one of which being the development of engines in Japan was severely lacking. There were many tries at creating propulsion for the craft. These attempts to build a true turbojet engine eventually led to the development of the TR-10, a small engine with a single-stage centrifugal compressor with a single-stage turbine. This was tested in the summer of 1943. Weighing only 250 kilograms, the engine was the first step to build an aircraft powered by jet engines in Japan. Soon the engine was modified, and with certain changes it was named the NE-12B. This engine was the best the Japanese constructors could achieve at the time. Eventually, the Japanese realized that without the necessary technological boost to overcome the problems with low thrust and lack of experience, the task would not be easy, if possible at all. In May 1944, the Japanese negotiated manufacturing rights to the Messerschmitt ME262, and examples of Junkers Jumo 004 and BMW 003 turbojets. However, the Japanese submarine I-29 was sunk by U.S. submarines after leaving Singapore while carrying engines and one ME262 example. Soon after the sinking, engineers and laborers began to toil day and night to build the NE-20, which was believed to be the most closely replicated version of the Jumo 004 that could be produced. On March 26, 1945, the first NE-20 engine was successfully tested in a cave set into a cliff in Yokosuka. Finally, an engine efficient enough for a practical use had been developed by Japan. The development of the Kitsuka airframe started on the 14th of September, 1944 when Imperial Japanese Navy representatives met with Nakajima at the Koizumi plant to discuss concepts and ideas. These ideas were put into practice in January 1945, when a wooden mock-up was ready for first inspection by Vice Admiral Misawa Wada. Firstly, the aircraft was supposed to be powered by the NE-12B engines, but soon it became obvious that the NE-20 engine outperformed it and was substantially a better design. Soon, changes were made, and by the end of March, the Kitsuka program entered its final stage. The first fuselage was complete on the 25th of April, 1945, and stress-tested. An aircraft without engines was completed by the 25th of June and prepared for testing. The fuselage was disassembled, loaded into trucks, and moved to the Nakajima Koizumi plant where two NE-20 engines were waiting. On the 27th of June, the aircraft was finally completed and declared as ready for testing. First testing of both engines on the aircraft took place on the 30th of June, although full testing could not be conducted due to restrictions of the runway. The aircraft had to be moved. Eventually, the airfield at Kizaru Air Base was chosen to be a place where the first Japanese jet aircraft would take off. The aircraft was prepared for tests at the end of July, and on the 27th, Lieutenant Wada conducted some successful taxiing tests. The final day was the 7th of August, the day after the Hiroshima bombing. It was an excellent morning with a 24 km per hour southwest wind, giving a crosswind blowing from the right across runway 20, pointing towards Tokyo Bay. The Kikil was only partially loaded with fuel to keep weight below 3,150 kilograms, which allowed 16 minutes of flight. A special guest, Lieutenant Commander Sasumu Takaoka, who was an experienced test pilot, climbed into the cockpit and prepared the machine for takeoff. On his mark, both NE-20 engines were started, and as soon as he was taxiing to the start of the runway, he lowered flaps to 20 degrees, and gradually increased the throttle to reach 11,000 RPM. Then he released the brakes, and the Kitsuka began to roll. No more than 25 seconds later, the first Japanese aircraft propelled by jet engines was airborne. When Takaoka climbed to 610 meters in altitude, he leveled off and conducted the test, which was carried out under strict restrictions not to exceed 314 kilometers per hour, and retract the landing gear. Observing the instruments in the cockpit, he noted all of the important statistics and figures to give feedback to technicians and ground crew. In case of engine failure, he circled over Kisazaru airfield. He also had to constantly throttle back to keep from exceeding the speed limit. A brief test of control sensitivity showed that rudder was rather stiff. Ailerons were heavy, but working, and elevators were overly responsive. After completing the test, Takaoka chose a long and shallow drop, extending the flaps to 40 degrees, and brought the turbojets to 7,000 RPM. On touchdown, he only needed moderate braking to bring Kitsuka to a stop. Using only 600 meters of runway, he brought the machine to the ramp amid crowds of cheering spectators and ground crews. The total flight time was around 11 minutes, and after reporting, Takaoka stated he experienced no problems with the engines and submitted his recommendations for improving the machine. This short flight was a symbolic event bringing Japan into the jet era. 
despite the dire situation Japan found herself in at that stage of the war, and both technological and material deficiencies, the Japanese managed to build a jet engine and eventually a successful tested jet-powered aircraft. A ceremonial official initial test flight was made on the 11th of August, four days later. For this flight, rocket-assisted takeoff, or RATO, units were fitted to the aircraft. However, because their alignment had been miscalculated, the acceleration was so heavy that the nose of the aircraft came up and the tail went down and skidded along the runway. As a result, the aircraft did not take off at all and was damaged when it ran off the end of the runway. Before it could be repaired, Japan had surrendered and the war was over leaving the only jet actually used in combat by the Japanese to be the Oka, a rocket-propelled and human-piloted kamikaze. If you would like to see a video on that project, just let me know. So jet. how did the Kika yes, compare to the ME-262s two. that worried the Allied Air Forces in 1944-45? to 45? The ME-262A1A had a top speed of 540 miles per hour, which left in the dust American pilots flying P-51D Mustangs with a maximum speed of 437 miles per hour. Plans for the interceptor version of the Kika called for a maximum speed of 443 miles per hour. In other words, its maximum speed was about the same as a Mustang, and the early jets of World War II were neither known for maneuverability or engine reliability. The most intriguing question, of course, is whether Japanese jets could have changed the outcome of the Pacific War had they been fielded in time. The best answer is to look at what happened to Germany which actually produced 1,400 ME-262s, some of which saw combat between November 1944 and May 1945. Though quite disturbing to the Allies, the jets didn't save the Third Reich. There were too many Allied aircraft, the Anglo-American Air Forces mounted standing patrols over airfields to catch the ME-262 during their vulnerable takeoff and landing runs, and Nazi Germany was being overrun by Allied tanks. With an even worse fuel and raw materials situation than Germany, Japan would have fared no better. The Kika would have been overwhelmed by the massive U.S. land-based and carrier-based formations that roamed over Japan in the last days of the war. If it had been fielded earlier, perhaps it could have made some difference over battlefields, such as the 1944 U.S. invasion of the Philippines, yet even there the Kika's short range would have rendered it unsuitable for the long-distance flying that characterized the Pacific War. The Kika might have been regulated to a defensive role over the home islands, intercepting daytime B-29 raids, except the Americans eventually switched the B-29s from day raids to night, when the radarless Kika could not fly, proving that as most sources like to say, the Nakajima Kika was too little, too late. Now, that was interesting. Okay, astronomical kits of Japanese jets. Now, the Kika is um, three models from 172nd scale, there's the MPM model. Well, wait, but actually, the first model that was put out was actually Pegasus. I have one of those. They're, the fuselage is kind of thick in that, but if you're just looking just to build a kit and you want a challenge, you can go for the Pegasus. It, I built a couple and they came out nice. There's the AZ models and the MPM models. In 148, hands down, it's the fine molds kit. It comes with the engine and everything. And Ventura did one too, but I'm not too sure of the quality of that kit. In 132nd scale, just this year, the LEM kit kits put out a Kiki in 132nd scale. And though it doesn't come with the any 20 engine, it will build up into a nice kit. It does come with the folded wings, too. Now, this is a note for um, both this kit and the um, J7W. Volks did bring out a conversion set for the, for the J7W to turn it into a jet in 32nd scale. Why they did it in 48 scale, I don't know, but the NE-20 engine is available from them if they still got it. And you could probably scratch build the whole, scratch build the stuff for it to hang the engine off of. Speaking of the J-7W, we, 
there's uh, two kits in, in 72nd scale by Hasegawa. One is the piston propeller driven version and one that was converted into the jet. Now they also have that in 148 scale. Hasegawa. They have both the propeller sorry, I get my mix all worded up here. Propeller driven version and the jet propelled version. And Volks also put out a 148 scale version of this kit, but just the piston gym version. And they also did a 132nd scale, which I already stated that there is a conversion set to turn it into a jet. There are two Y. Now, there's only one kit. It's the five molds kit. It's the only one I could find. Same as Mitsubishi KI-83. I can only find one kit, and that was the 172nd scale MPM kit. So that is that on that subject. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video. And please remember to subscribe to my channel and punch that like button. You also can donate to my channel through my PayPal, which is on the main page of my channel. And you also can donate through Patreon. So, as always, every build is an adventure, so go make it awesome. And we'll see you again later. And you have a good day. Goodbye.